need much of an introduction um, due to his award-winning past, is uh, Olaf, and he's here to give us an update on Fusesoft. Over to you, Olaf. Thank you, Julius. Uh, welcome. I'm here to talk about Fusok. First a bit of me, I'm uh, working for a company called Camcom here in uh, town. Uh, outside of work, I'm also involved in various open source initiatives like the Foster Foundation uh, and uh, a couple of other things. I was also once called an extraordinary individual by Chips Alliance, which I think was very funny. Um, also, uh, in addition to uh, advocacy, I'm also running uh, way too many um, open source projects um, that I don't really have time for. Um, you can check out a few of these here. And we will touch upon a few of these uh, during this talk, namely Fusok and Eldice, mostly. So, when you do a project, you probably have a problem you want to solve. And for Fusok, it's the problem of IP reuse. If you're doing a chip design, or if you're doing a software design, if you're doing a design at all, you probably want to have as little uh, application-specific things as possible and just reuse whatever you can because that's often trusted and known. Uh, so you have a lot of commodity IP when it comes to chip design, CPUs, bus infrastructures, and, and like SPI controllers and things like that. Uh, but in order to, and these come from different sources. They can be your own or they can be bought from somewhere or found online. Uh, but in either case, you need a smooth way to integrate them because if you don't have that, then you probably won't be able to resist the temptation to write everything from scratch, which everyone does all the time. Uh, so as an example, uh, this is a pretty simple SOC. This is called uh, Veolf, which is one of my projects. Uh, it's a CPU, bus infrastructure, couple of peripherals, nothing to write home about. It's a pretty standard thing. Uh, did I write all these things myself? No, I reused most of these things. Uh, actually, I wrote very little of these myself. Uh, and they came from various sources uh, and were never meant to be connected to each other. Uh, we can look at it like this. This is like a bus-centric way of, of seeing it, but we can also look at more software-centric way of seeing it, like a dependency uh, thing. Like we have a, an SOC that depends on uh, a lot of IP cores. These IP cores by themselves can depend on other IP cores, like utility libraries or, or things like that. Uh, and now I know that traditionally, when you built up a structure like this, people used to just copy everything into a new source code uh, folder. And, and that is very bad because then you have no idea. When you fix a bug, you have like five, six pro different projects with the same uh, IP and you have fixed it one in one place, but not the other ones. So then people think, oh yeah, we can use Git submodules or SVN externals or things like that to, to, uh, to just reuse things. That works to some extent, but at some point you will have like uh, a dependency where, where you have two, for example, two different IP cores depending on the same library, but they expect different versions and you will have some kind of collision. This is actually a well-known problem in package management space. It's called the deadly diamond of death problem. Yes, I'm serious. You can look it up on Wikipedia. Uh, so for, I mean, this is a solved problem for, for the software space. You have package managers for everything you have uh, for uh, you have the uh, uh, language specific package managers and you have like your Debian and uh, RPM packages and things like that. And for chip design, you have Fusok, uh, which, and the idea of package manager is of course to have, to solve the dependency problem and have a common interface so that your tools know what to expect and know where to look for, for certain files and, and know how to integrate them together. Uh, a project like this is only as successful as the number of actual packages you have. And I will make the bold claim that Fusok is the most used package manager for uh, chip designs. Uh, I have not had anyone oppose this yet. Uh, these are some of the libraries that I'm aware of, uh, which, uh, I mean, uh, for example, OpenTitan is, is a prominent user of Fusok. And uh, through that, I know that other people are coming into Fusok. And this is used in academia, it's used by the industry, it's used by hobbyists for, for just single designs uh, or up to larger and uh, more complex uh, SOCs. I have, of course, a lot of people who just have their two, three Fusok compatible cores. And then you have a lot of companies doing this internally. And I have, of course, no idea how many packages outside of this exist. All I know is that I get uh, bug reports from companies uh, and then I kind of suspect they use Fusok. 
Um, so how do you make uh, IP core fuser compatible? You write a core description file, and that's it, basically. You describe your core, and this means also that you don't need to change anything in your core. I know that many of these projects like to enforce directory structures or things like that, but I think that ship has sailed, sorry. Uh, people will have different opinions on where files should be, if it should go in the RTL directory or the source directory and things like that. Fusoc just tries to adapt to whatever you have. Uh, so it's very flexible in that regard. Uh, you describe a lot of different things in, in Fusoc. The most uh, important things are like the name and, and which files it contains and, and which dependencies you have on other cores. So that is like the description part of it. But in order to actually do something with IP cores, uh, you need to put them through, uh, through some EDA tools eventually. And for that you have targets. So the target is similar to make file targets, it's, it's, it's the purpose. I want to do a simulation, for example, or I want to do a build for this FPGA board, or I want to target this uh, uh, ASIC technology, for example. And then the targets, in your target descriptions, you will pull in the file sets you need, you will uh, tell what, which parameters that are relevant for this target and, and so on. And also two specific options, like some simulator might uh, have some options you need to turn on for, for something, or you need to tell an FPGA tool which exact uh, device you're targeting and, and so on. Uh, I often get the question if Fusoc supports this or that. Like, do you support Amaranth, or do you support Spinal HDL, or do you support Chisel? And the answer is yes and no, uh, because Fusoc doesn't really care about that. Uh, what we instead do is that we have a kind of plug-in system uh, where you can tell Fusoc to call an external command that will take your description of any kind and turn it into something that the EDA tools understand. Because in the end of the day, what you need to have is to, tools, files in formats that the EDA tools understand. And they typically they understand TKL and they understand Verilog or VHDL and they understand some other formats. Uh, I used a few of these myself, uh, like the version generator, you can tell it to pick up uh, information from the Git repository and, and, and uh, create some defines, and then you can use that in your code. Or, or the ROM generator, for example, like if you have a bootloader in, in C or assembly, and then you can have it generate a hex file uh, for you. Uh, or it can be more uh, specific stuff, like the VR core that was uh, uh, Carol talked about uh, just now. Uh, you, you give it the config, and then it will spit out all the uh, necessary uh, include files that you need to uh, implement that. And this goes into an EDAM file, which is uh, short for EDA metadata. Um, we'll get back to that soon. So at this point, I think some of you in the audience probably say, how oh, we have this tool already in-house. Yes, you probably have. I don't think I've been at any place with a sizable uh, IP collection that doesn't have a system like this already in-house. Now the problem is that the person who originally wrote this thing uh, is either not longer at the company, or they work in senior management, or they are way too busy to actually fix all the stuff that, uh, uh, that needs to be fixed for new features or, or fixing bugs and things like that. So by using an open source tool like this, uh, you can avoid a lot of maintenance, in-house maintenance. Uh, if you need fe new features, you can get someone to actually implement these features. Or you can, of course, still do it yourself if you want to. And onboarding and training is, is very important, actually, because uh, you will spend a lot of time training new engineers to use your very esoteric tool flow that isn't used anywhere else. So now I've looked at a bit at the uh, leftmost, rightmost part of, uh, of this picture. We have looked at uh, Fusoc, uh, like dependency management, and it, it pulls in IP cores from, from different places. And as I said, at the end of the day, you need to actually do something with all these IP cores. Uh, and for that, you, you collect all the information about the whole system in, in this EDAM file, EDA metadata file, and then you send it to another project called Edelice. Edelice was originally one part of Fusoc, but it grew out to its, its own uh, project. So Fusoc handles the package management, the dependency management. Edelice handles all the EDA tool interfacing part. Uh, so now with a single core description file, you can, you can target all the, all the tools that EDLI supports. And 
People are using Fusox standalone, and other people are using either Lite standalone, and that's totally fine. If you want to use both, do that, or just one part of it. Like, typically, the Lite user would be someone who has come up with a new uh, language, for example, uh, and they spend a lot of effort uh, working on, on this language and uh, the compilers and things like that, but uh, then they also need to interface a lot of EDA tools, and then they can just export their Verilog which I get to generate in the end, and uh, into an EDAM file, and then ha let Edelice handle all the boring stuff of talking to EDA tools. So I will talk a bit about Edelice now. Uh, as I said, it's, it's a tool for, for a library for interfacing EDA tools from, from Python. Uh, it currently supports about 40 different EDA tools, and these are of all kinds. It's simulators, it's formal verification tools, linter tools, ASIC flows, uh, FPGA flows, uh, and uh, like, like utility things that, that are more specific to certain use cases. Um, and Edelice it by se in itself uh, is a bit modular. You have all the individual tools are implemented as, as classes. Then you have an overarching uh, flow that, you that is also implemented where you can combine these uh, tools in different ways and they all pass EDA EDAM uh, metadata between each other. So each tool takes an EDAM file as an input and generates a new EDAM file as an output. So for example, Yosis in this case here, it would get all the Verilog uh, and then it would create a netlist and then this netlist, the next tool would know what to do with this netlist and so on. So you can build up uh, arbitrary flows this way uh, and of course you can switch out different components and you can add front ends for example to first convert all your uh, uh, VHDL files to Verilog on the fly or if you if you have a tool that only speaks Verilog for example so it's, it's very flexible in that way each of these tools can also uh, optionally be run inside a docker container which is pretty handy uh, uh, if you want to do that um, and then, yeah, you can do you can do like gate level simulation, which is kind of first doing synthesis and then doing simulations. So you have two two different flows that you can connect to each other. Uh, so that's the idea: keeping it modular so that you leave it up to the user. You have a lot, couple of predefined flows, and then if you need something more advanced, you can do that yourself. So to sum things up, uh, you can work. If you have a lot of people working in, in, in a group or so, or in different groups, you, they can work independently on parts of the design uh, without interfering with each other, uh, because it's, each IP is, is, is very separate from each other. Uh, and you can, of course, then reuse these in two different designs. I mean, in many places you have, you, you do variations of your, your projects, or you do a new project that is 90% the same thing as your old one. Uh, it also easily lets you target different tools. Uh, so, I mean, perhaps in one group you're using VCS for uh, simulation, and in the other you're using Xelium or something. Uh, and then you can still use the same core description file and just, with the command line switch, tell you, I want to use this simulator now instead of this one. Porting between different uh, EDA tools. I have a, I have a project called um, Blinky. No, it's called Let's Believe. Uh, and it targets now hundred different FPGA boards uh, with the same core description file. So looking ahead, of course I want to use more adaption. Uh, it's the world's most used, I think, but it's still not super well used. Uh, more EDA tools, of course, and I prefer if you write these, if you know the EDA tools. More advanced flows, and I want to have a, like a public package pool so that you can easy, more easily distribute your, your own IP cores. Uh, and of course, I want this to become an industry standard. And uh, at some point, I really need to <laughs> have some improved documentation as well. These are very ambitious goals. So, uh, and I realized that maybe it won't happen overnight. So I kind of simplified them a bit uh, to make them more <laughs> achievable um, than uh, otherwise. Um, so with that, I say thank you. And I have stickers also, uh, if you want. Thanks, Olaf.
questions? Yep. <clears throat> uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, I've, got, I've got something which I, we built in house, which is kind of similar, which is you know, yeah. kind of the point you're trying to make. One issue that we've run into with that stops us kind of publishing tool wrappers is uncertainty about, I guess, vendor sensitivity to you invoking their tools. Do you have any stories of being told off or do you have any sort of general advice for, for what to do about that? So, yeah, I, I agree. And especially when it comes to certain three companies uh, that have a history of, of doing this. I have not received any threats so far. Uh, but I, I, I know that this is a real possibility, uh, and when that happens, I don't know what to do. Uh, but I hopefully they will just let it be. I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely insane that these companies can like say that, that the command line interface is part of their proprietary information. It's so brain dead that they should just not do that. Yeah, I agree. Uh, quick question, Olaf. Um, does it do multi-threading? <laughs> like, well, it's up to the tools. I mean, for yeah. example, uh, for Vivado, I know that, that that you can send just a jobs parameter and no, no, it will but, scale out. But I mean, like, imagine you've got mm. a core preparation step that takes five minutes, and you could be doing other things in parallel. Does it do that at the moment? Can you pass like a dash J eight to Fusesoc, like you can to Make, and it kind of. Well, it kind of uses uh, make in, in the back end. It's supposed also to use, like, uh, in the future, we'll make it uh, run on Slurm and, and, and India and, and things like that so that you can spread out your workloads over a cluster, for example. Uh, but it, will, it knows which steps depend on other steps. So as long as you have described your, your, your compute graph, it will do its best. Yeah, I, gu I guess my, my question is, is related, like, um, so we have tools like Basil and Buck2 that do caching and distributed builds. Do you envision like a Edelize to Buck2 or Edelize to Basil? Or yes. do you envision Edelize to just do the same thing and re-implement? No, so <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question. And um, I have customers who uh, want to build in uh, Fusoc or Edelize into their uh, tool flows. So we have done some bit of effort to make it more uh, embeddable uh, in that sense. And also I have, Basis specifically, I have, I have ideas for, for how to make the integration better. Like, I think that Edelize has all the information to be able to generate the build rules. Uh, I think that is, for basis specifically, I think that is the integration point I would, I would choose. Well, yeah, both speak uh, Starlark, but Python-esque. Uh, Buck2 and Basil are both uh, Starlark-based, so. Okay, I... I I haven't really kept up, unfortunately, with all this. But yeah, the, the idea is that uh, it, it should be modular enough that you can e more easily integrate this into. So, so few Edelize will hold the know will have the knowledge about like how to deal with like the specific things for each EDA tools. But how you invoke it, that should be someone else's problem. Right now, it's Make that does all this. But I want, if possible, to to have other uh, invoking systems. Probably time for one last question. But if there are none, then we can thank Olaf again. Thank you. Hey friends. Good to see you, man. Thanks for coming.